Welcome to Building with Brick, Foundational Wisdom on Coaching, Careers, and Christ. This leadership podcast was spawned by Coach Brickner's book, So You Want to Be a Coach, which is the story of a corporate executive who made a drastic career change and became a head men's basketball coach. Dr. Brickner's book is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook on Amazon.com or go to his website, www.drjoebrickner.com. That's D R J O E Brickner.com. Now, here's this week's podcast. Welcome back, folks. My guest, Mike Tharp, international journalist, editor of the book that I wrote, um, and teammate of mine on the national championship team, uh, and a very good friend. Mike, before the break, we were talking about you playing in Japan and how your playing on the different Japanese teams allowed you to really get into their culture and, and learn some things that you probably never would have learned by not playing basketball. Um, did playing basketball in foreign countries provide any career opportunities or maybe reporting opportunities while you were doing doing your job? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I went to North Korea in 1979. One of five Americans the first to go in there since 1953. Wow. When the armistice was signed, wow! And uh, I asked my minders. Each, each of us had at least one minder. I had two uh, that I wanted to run every morning, and I wanted to play basketball against some North Koreans. And I, I, I did. They said fine, fine, and so I sh- show up the next morning. At hotel lobby in my running gear and they're in their suits ties and plastic sole shoes and uh we go out the door and i lose them in about a half block <laughs> <laughs> and then i just took off and ran across a river uh north of pyongyang the city and i said well that looks pretty nice so i turned it off and started running along the river. And then I started noticing military equipment. And then I started noticing guys with AK-47s in uniform. And uh, this guy comes up to me and basically puts me on the ground uh, while he's trying to figure out what to do with me. Yeah. And it, we were there ostensibly for the international table t- tennis ter- uh, tournament. So I kept going ping pong, ping pong, hoping they would think I was one of the athletes. Uh, but whoever decided it, they eventually let me go. Uh, he just said, stand up. And he pointed back to the highway and I said, uh, come Sanida, that's thank you in Korean, and took off. I didn't want him to change his mind. But when I got to, and I was the only person among us who saw any kind of military equipment, the North Koreans had made a concerted effort to conceal all that from the visiting foreign journalists. So I, I got to see that because I was a runner. When I played basketball, against this team they were all shorter than me i was six three it was six three (laughs) and uh they had hands like wood they were just really hard hands i remember that and they didn't care about who won they just wanted to beat the shit out of the foreigner that was me, and uh, that's that's how I remember their hands being so hard because they used them extensively. 
So I guess the, you know any cultural information I got from that game, it it was that the the process mattered more than the uh, outcome. So that that was uh, North Korea. Uh, I played in South Korea, but those are mostly pickup games uh, with other foreigners, other Americans. Uh, I played in Taiwan. My first visit to Taiwan, within an hour after landing, I was running full court. Wow. Uh, my friend Eddie Joe told me yeah. where to go and who to see. Yeah. That's cool. And uh, same thing in Singapore. I went there for four days in 1984. And played outdoors with some guys uh didn't play in hong kong but in 1969 and sent to vietnam in july of 69 and uh, there was uh there were enough of us who wanted to play basketball in our company that that we formed a team and there was an outdoor court with baskets at, at each end it wasn't as big as a usual full court but it had baskets at each end and we played other teams in the battalion and from elsewhere and you've had a lot of basketball highlights in your life far more than i have but one of mine was when we won the battalion championship uh, uh, and they gave us these little plastic uh, trophies and we we got to go to the officers club even though most all of us were enlisted guys so they took us to the officers club as a treat uh, where we got uh, free beers and <laughs> we had a couple of games called by incoming rockets or mortars where we had to get the hell off the court and find shelter before we could go on. But one of those guys uh, I'm still in good touch with, he he basically got me into running, uh, serious running. There was a, a, a road that ran around the perimeter of the base camp where we were. And he had run at Southeast Missouri State. I think he'd run a 409 mile in college. And uh, he also lifted weights a lot. Uh, and so he taught me how to run. And uh, I got I got to be pretty fast eventually. I was going uh, five miles and. 30 minutes and 10 oh. miles in an hour. Wow. We were pushing. And I, uh, at the end, there was a gradual decline in the road uh, toward the end of where we started. And I just pat him on the butt and said, take off, Larry, because he still had more yeah. than I did. And I, I just remember seeing him boom zoom away from me but that he was on that ball club and we're still in close touch that's great what did, what did the vietnam war teach you one of the worst experiences i've ever had but i made also some of the best friends i've ever had and uh it taught me that governments routinely lie to their people uh, and that fraud waste and abuse are inevitable in a huge organization like the army i saw it up close and personal several times of uh, they call them ghost soldiers soldiers who weren't there but uh, maybe had been there and they this staff sergeant this e6 uh, got his money instead of 
directing it on to the soldier. And that's just a tiny example that went on all over the country. Hmm. And there's some things that have happened to you health-wise because of your time in Vietnam. Is that not true? Yeah, I was exposed to Agent Orange. I, I was based right across from Ma Air Base where the shipments of Agent Orange and some of the other rainbow uh, defoilants were offloaded from the aircraft coming in uh, from the states, from Monsanto and from Dow Chemical and other outfits like that. And uh, I also traveled around the country more than most soldiers because I wrote for an army magazine over there. And so I was able to jump on a helicopter or a little plane and go somewhere uh, that ordinarily I never would have gotten to go. And one of those places was Kuchi, which was, uh, we found out after the war was just riddled with tunnels where the Viet Cong had lived and used as staging areas uh, when they would come up above ground and attack Americans. But they also, and so the Americans started uh, pouring Agent Orange down these tunnels. And mm. uh I, I of course, did not go through the tunnels when I was there, but I was walking around where they were uh, reporting a story on the on the airfield there. And one result of the exposure was tragic for me because it meant I could no longer play basketball or run. And that was uh, neuropathy in both of my feet that started in 2012. Uh, and I also think that the prostate cancer I had in 2005 came from exposure to that. And I'm in the process of um, getting ready to send the voluminous paperwork at the Veteran Affairs Agency requires for compensation. Uh, I applied in 2014 for uh, compensation for my neuropathy, and they rejected it right away because they said I hadn't reported it within two years of my active duty service. Well, hell, it didn't happen until 40 years later. Uh, so th they rejected it, but then out of the blue in the mail, I started getting these monthly checks for $109, uh, just about enough for Viagra for a month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm getting, I'm getting ready to file another one because I've got another health issue that I'm dealing with, which I think is related to those urban sides. Yeah, maybe we can, uh, <clears throat> and I'm aware of what you're talking about, maybe we can visit about that in, in the next session a little bit. Okay. Um, were there any other war zones that you visited? Yeah, I was in the Persian Gulf War for almost four months, and one of the photographs I sent you was of this Palestinian who was the coach of the national youth team of Saudi Arabia. And he, after the war was over in February, he let me come to practice with one of his teams. And of course, all I had done for the previous two and a half months was sit in a Humvee and sleep in a tent. So I was in bad shape, but, uh, I played. I, I did okay. Uh, and then Somalia, uh, Somalia came next and that was too dangerous to go anywhere outside on your own. Uh, Bosnia, I played 
three on three with one of my war buddies, Mike Hedges, who played at Northern Kentucky about 10 years after you and I did. Um, uh, and he, he's a big old hillbilly about six, five. And uh, there's a famous picture famous to us. Uh, we were coming down from the front lines, in Sarajevo, uh, the capital, which had been under constant shelling by the Serbs against the Croatians and, and the Muslims. And I saw that the, when we were coming down in our r Russian jeeps, I saw this basketball hoop and these two really skinny guys shooting at it. And obviously they were skinny because the food was really hard to come by, uh, in that city. And so I said, stop, stop. And we went over and joined them and they got two more guys. Hedges was on one team and I was on the other. And our, our photographer for U.S. News and World Report took a great picture of me throwing a no-look pass by Hedges' eyes. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, he's standing there like this, and just, it just zooms by to my teammate for a layup. And he left one of his jobs in Washington, D.C., and they asked me for something to remember him by, and I sent him that picture. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he he's a Kentucky freak now, Joe. He lives and breathes Kentucky basketball. They can do no wrong. And of course, he always brings up certain games or records uh, between KU and yeah. Kentucky. Yep, yep. You mentioned U.S. News and World Report, um, and I'm aware that you were employed by the Wall Street Journal. New York Times. Uh, were there others, kind of big time uh, publishers or whoever newspapers? Were there others that that you'd worked for during that time? I I wrote for the Far Eastern Economic Review for three yeah. years as Tokyo bureau chief mm -hmm. uh, from uh, eighty one to eighty four, and it was the most respected publication on Asia at the time. It had some really uh, smart people, most of them Brits, uh, who knew all about wh whatever country or issue they were covering. And uh, since I had already been in Tokyo six years by then, they uh, let me write about stuff going on in Japan, and I guess were satisfied for it by it. And it was a really quirky writer's magazine. You, you you could basically write what you know, very British in that way. You didn't have to always attribute stuff to so-and-so said. It was just based on your own innate knowledge of the subject uh, that was credible because of the way that you wrote it uh, to make it uh, believable to your audience it was fun so it was a kind of a pseudo editorial way of yeah exactly writing. interesting really interesting um just briefly what did um your experiences in these all these different places i mean you've been so many places that, that you know, you're an American, you grew up with American values, etc. Uh, what do you take from all the different places that you came from? Is there any one or two, maybe themes or whatever, that, that just stand out to you, regardless of where you were? This is far from politically correct, Joe, but uh, I, I found out that there were two peoples that I hate, just dislike because of 
where they come from, and that is Somalis and Saudis. Uh, I couldn't stand eat people from either place. And that's just a basic prejudice that emerged from my time in those countries and dealing with them. Uh, but as far as other lessons learned from going to six war zones, I saw that the technology that soldiers and Marines have today far outstripped whatever we had in Vietnam. And it was just in a generation that that all unfolded. For example, like telephone application of FaceTime, which anybody would think, oh, good, this poor soldier can connect with his wife and kids and loved ones mm -hmm. and see them. And, and that's all true. Uh, but it also is double-edged because the soldier often hears about the problems that the family has and he can't do a bloody thing about it because he's 6,000 miles away in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, in Vietnam, we had these, I guess you could call them phone booths. They were called, called Mars stations, military affiliated radio stations. And you had to line up to try to make a call and the calls were went to somebody with a ham radio <laughs> somewhere in America and that guy would then dial the phone number for me to reach my parents and uh, we had to say over after every uh, bit of conversation like uh, how's everything going there, Mom? Over? <laughs> and we we joked about it outside with, of some guy uh, getting a brown a brown helmet, as we used to call him at Saint Benedict, getting dumped <laughs> by his wife or fiance or something. And he he's so trained by the military by this time that he says. WTF over <laughs> <laughs> and uh he didn't use the initials. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know technology really has changed significantly and you know, when they're taking drone strikes and they're you know, controlling it from thousands of miles away, it's just absolutely amazing what they can do today. Yeah. When I was in Iraq uh in 2008, I embedded with the 10th Mountain Division in Kirkuk in northern Iraq. The commanding officer was a colonel about 6'6", six, six, real uh, gung-ho, and he let me fly around with him in his Black Hawk helicopter to three or four of the outlying stations where there were only a few men, uh, 20 or 30 guys inside a little fortress and on the third one as we were landing he said uh, Mike I want you to talk to these guys when we land and I thought holy cow okay. I told him okay and then I did the best I could uh, as a what was I then I was in my 60s and I had long gray hair and a gray mustache and the public affairs officer described me as a cross between Ernie Pyle and Mark Twain which was <laughs> really nice and, and totally off the mark but I just praised these guys for their patience and their ability to use the technology in ways that help them stay alive. And we 
didn't have anything close to that in Vietnam. And I'm still in touch with that colonel, by the way, and still in touch with the public affairs officer and a couple of other guys I met. Uh, it's pretty deep. It's amazing your network of all the different people you know from the different places you've been. I mean, what a, a valuable asset that is to have. It you is. Know, just a, a terrific. Well, Mike, I think we're going to take another break. And all right, uh, sir. When we come back, I'd like to talk about your 16 years of Catholic education and, you know, how did that shape you and um, I also want to talk about what you're going through physically. I know we just found out recently that um, they found cancer again and, and I, I want to visit with you about that. You know, we're all so concerned and we're all praying for you and um, but I'd just like to visit with you a little bit about it if you don't mind. Sounds good. Okay Mike. Be right back. 